I'm working on a project called the Fern House. It's going to be a teeny cabin guest retreat. My goal is to create a place that's going to be ideal for people to get connected with themselves, connected with nature, and connected with their ability to be creative. I think it's really important for the items in the cabin, and there won't be many, to be very inspiring. I want them to really reflect the creativity of other individuals so that the people staying there can feel an urge to maybe be creative themselves. One of the items that I want to make beautiful in this cabin and inspiring is the things that'll be in the kitchen because I'm not gonna put cabinets into the kitchen. It's gonna be open shelving. I want the plates, the mugs, the necessities that will be there to be pretty and functional. In other words, I'm going to create some functional art. Now, I could probably buy this from a local potter. However, my friend down the road has this amazing she shed that her husband built her. It is her own private pottery shop, and I am so privileged to be able to come down here and create anytime I want to. So I decided that I was going to make fern-themed plates for my kitchen and mugs. Now I decided to make drop plates for the kitchen. Um, it's been probably 10 years or more since I've sat down at a potter's wheel and tried doing anything like that. Drop plates are slab work. I place a large slab of clay over a frame and then literally drop it on the floor. Now what I did here was before putting my slab into the frame, I picked some ferns um, and rolled them into the clay to create an imprint. And I'm pulling them off here. And we'll see how this goes. Um, my initial thought was I would just be able to leave uh, the imprint as is, but it turned out these you know, leaves are pretty fragile and their imprint was fairly shallow. So we'll see later I come back to do some carving and to deepen the impression so that it doesn't get lost in the glazing process. What I'm doing here is I'm getting ready to place my slab into an 11 inch frame. Now the frame itself um, will stay with this plate for the next couple days um, until the plate dries enough to be able to come out of the frame and maintain its shape. Um, I lifted it up, I didn't catch it on video, but I lifted it up to about eye level and drop it onto the floor. The impact makes the clay slab sink into the shape of the frame and create the perfect drop plate. So here we are about two days later. It was a Friday afternoon. It had rained all day, just a beautiful, steady rain. It was actually rather cool. The kids got bored and they asked if we could go to the pottery shop and try making a project. So that was perfect. It was time for me to come down and check on my drop plate. It was formed up enough that I was able to pop it out of its mold. I also had this slab mug that I had created um, and I wanted to see if I could work it off the plate. Before I could get into my project, which I was really getting excited about by this time, I had to help the kids get started on what they wanted to make today. My youngest wanted to make a pinch pot style flower pot. My oldest wanted to make kitchen trivets. Um, I could have let them work more with the building, but I was kind of wanting to get them up and going quickly so they could work on their details and decorations and I could get absorbed into my project. Now, again, like some of the other things you're probably watching me do, it might seem a little excessive that I'm taking the time to do some of these projects in the grand scheme of things, but 
Honestly, I feel like they're little things I can do and this is something that's available to me and it's a kind of project I enjoy and it won't all happen in one setting. It'll happen in small bits and pieces throughout the summer, but it brings me a lot of joy to be able to bring this small piece of creativity into the cabin and I think in the long run I'll be really tickled that I took the time to do it. I probably could have come down a day earlier to um, smooth up some of the edges on this plate with um, a watering sponge, but I hadn't. So here I am using a harder tool to shave off some of the sharper, rougher edges and um, just clean it up to give it a more finished appearance. I have worked with clay off and on over the years many times. I absolutely enjoy it. It was my number one favorite thing to do as a child in elementary school. I so look forward to the day that we got to go to the pottery shop and make a clay project each year. I feel like I hear people sometimes say about how much they wish they had a space to work with clay and make pottery. And sometimes it seems like maybe you need something, you know, elaborate or you need to have a wheel. But um, as amazing as this she shed is, you really don't need even a space this big to do it. Um, if you are willing to do hand building, um, you don't need a wheel. And if you just have a small space in your house that you can get dirty and leave a project to air dry, you can actually create a lot um, at home and oftentimes you can get your projects fired um, either from your supplier where you buy your clay supplies or other local potters, um, especially if you know somebody or are in an area where there is somebody that is offering uh, classes, uh, they will often um, have their kilns available to fire people's projects. I absolutely love how multi-sensory working with clay is, and I think that it is a very relaxing and therapeutic way of being creative. Um, just getting into a project and going with it, and, you know, if something gets messed up, it's not the end of the world. You just make it all wet and start over again. So what I'm doing here is I'm just using a small tool to actually carve out the um, pattern of the fern leaf. It was fairly um, shallow, the imprint, when I made it with just the leaf. And I know that if I put glaze over that, it'll just get lost and you won't even be able to see the pattern. So um, I'm not doing anything really fancy here. I am literally just taking little chunks out, following the pattern that nature has already made, um, enjoying that process. The the plate itself is leather hard, so it is really easy to um, go through, make the cuts, and just swipe the excess to the side. In my mind, I kind of think this is really a low to no cost project for me as well. So, um, you know, if something happens to these plates, they get broke, whatever. It's okay. No big deal. No big loss. One of the things I enjoy doing is teaching our classes uh, with homeschool kids. I think it is so important that we teach our kids to be creative because so many of the things that we do in life actually ask our kids to stop being creative and to, um, you know, follow formats and um, expectations. So giving them a space to express themselves creatively is really important. I find that one of the things you hear people say so often is, you know, well, they just get really critical of themselves, honestly, when it comes to things that they make and they're picking it apart and nothing's right. And I say, you know, I think the problem is, is that you're creating from your head and it's really important that we create from our heart, um, that we just kind of get into the flow of what is feeling right to us and what makes us feel good as we're doing it. Um, you know, we need to stop overthinking it and getting in our head about how a project should look and instead just make a project the way it feels right to us and then 
being creative feels really rewarding and feels like time really well spent. Now, when I started in the shop, I showed you that I had created a mug as well. And here it is. I'm now working on carving out the fern imprint that I made on it. The mug is a hand-built slab project as well. There was a template I used, um, which essentially was a rectangle and a circle. And I cut it out of the slab, attached the two together to form the mug. When I scored and slipped up the side to seam it together, I did not go the whole way to the top. And instead, I actually left a portion of that slab drooped down to form a handle of sorts. You'll see that here in a little bit. Um, but I thought it was kind of a unique idea. I'm thinking each mug I make will be different. So I wanted to... Um, really bring some different forms and create some interest when people are sitting in the teeny cabin and looking over towards the kitchen and seeing the hand-built pottery that is in it. This is a better view of the handle that I made on the mug. It fits my right hand perfectly. Not so much my left. It's actually really comfortable though. I think it's the perfect kind of mug too if you're sitting out on a cool evening having a cup of tea or cool morning having your coffee to warm your hand uh, since you'll be gripping the mug directly. One of the challenges for me when I'm working on creative projects is staying in that present moment with what I'm making. Uh, it's really easy as time passes by for me to start thinking about other things I might need to do that day um, or, you know, in this case, other parts of the project like, you know, what will my other mugs look like or how might I make some of the other plates different. So um, staying focused and in the moment with the project I'm making um, is a challenge for me. I find though when I can stay very present with what I'm making, the creative energy that just goes into it shifts and uh, I'm generally happier with what I've made and just feel more satisfied after the time I've spent on it. I'm pretty happy with what got accomplished today. Now the only thing left to do is to leave it dry the rest of the way until it can get fired. But I am looking forward to popping back and forth throughout the summer and doing a whole lot more down in the shop. Well, it's back to the trails for me. Time to uh, do a lot more work with the chainsaw and log splitter. But before I start today, I actually need to tend to our own wood stove. Ten years ago when we moved into this property, we had a central boiler installed. It is a wood stove, outdoor wood stove, that not only heats our home, but it heats our hot water. So we keep it running throughout the year. We end up burning the deadfall timber on our property, mostly. Um, there's always cleanup in the woods that can be done. Um, we also do occasionally have to take down trees for various reasons um, and uh, they get saved and split for in our boiler. Generally this is my husband's job but when he's pretty busy with things I don't mind helping out. I love what this wood boiler does for our energy bill. Our electric bill seldom goes over $100 a month. Having this wood stove has made me really become aware of the environment I live in. Before I ever tended to it or dealt with it much, I just was really oblivious of the woods I lived in. I just drove through them as I came and went and didn't pay attention to what was happening in them. Um, but as I've become more involved in tending to the wood stove um, and just understanding um, the resource that wood is to us, I find myself paying attention to where there are, you know, sick trees um, or dying trees. Even the kids are, you know, aware of those things and point them out to me. Um, you know, after a storm, we're noticing where, you know, a tree maybe went down somewhere in the woods 
And we're, you know, assessing, is that something that we can drag out and use as one of our resources for energy at home? So don't get me wrong. I love modern convenience as much as the next person. Um, and this wood stove was never my idea. This was something my husband had wanted to do for a long time. I was pretty indifferent about it, but you know, I appreciate having it now. And I think it's good to sometimes lose small conveniences in our life. Um, because when we lose the convenience, we just become more aware of the way we live and the way we use our resources, right? Um, if something isn't easy to access all the time, all of a sudden we place a different value on it. So, uh, you know, the hot shower I'm going to have later has a different value to me now when I had to make a fire to make that water warm than what it did when I never gave any thought to the electricity that was generated to heat the water in my hot water heater to give me that warm shower before. All right, success. Now that chore is done, I can move on to what it is I'm hoping to get accomplished this afternoon. What are you doing, buddy? Huh? What's this? You got sidewalk chalk on you? Huh? You got sidewalk chalk on you? Hmm? You gonna help me drive? You gonna help me drive? Look here. Huh? You gonna help me drive? No, don't eat my shoelaces. Be a bad goat like that. So this is Brownie. Brownie is one of our seven goats. Him and his twin sister were born the week of Christmas this past year. They are both small enough that they still often slip out from the main pen where all the goats stay and join us in the yard and hang out at leisure. So we enjoy that, but uh, they honestly don't, don't wander far from the house at all. So he won't follow me down on my trip to the woods. So the Fern House is somewhere between a quarter and a half a mile from my house, um, and it's all downhill, or uphill, depending on which direction you're going. <laughs> we live on top of a ridge. Um, so I'm sure, sure happy with the side-by-side -side that we purchased this past year. This was like the wood stove, something my husband had been wanting us to get, and I was kind of indifferent about. It didn't make a big difference to me one way or the other. In the past, we've used four-wheelers and golf carts to get around on our property. I didn't really think we needed a side-by-side -side machine. Now we have it. I love it, and I use it all the time. It's really handy for going over to our neighbor's cabin that we co-host through Airbnb, and it is definitely coming in handy for this project. So we're very happy with it. Our tractor is a coyote as well. So two pieces of their equipment and things are going well. Right down there, that is the Fernhouse building site, generally speaking, in that area. Um, so we'll be there in just a moment. Now I'm turning off our main drive and heading back um, the upper trail that takes me back to the site location. There's actually three different trails that will lead you into the site location. Um, so today I am taking some time to clear this trail and um, work on clearing the actual intersection of those trails. Um, and. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much needs cleaned up and how much I'll get accomplished in the time I have. I added bar oil and put the batteries in place now. They're fully charged and then I think I should be ready to go. Yep, there we go. <laughs> the only thing I need to really get is a funnel. This bar oil needs a funnel. 
A. Floris virginiensis. <laughs> that is just fun to say. That is the scientific name for this flatback millipede. We find them pretty commonly in our woods here. They are pretty much like the worms of the forest. They decompose the decaying material and help to make the soil nutrient rich. They also can excrete a cyanide if they feel really threatened, but generally they're just harmless to humans. So millipedes have two leg sets per body segment. Centipedes have one. There's the difference. Today it was a little hard to stay focused working in the woods. I was just noticing a lot of really cool things in nature around me and I had to keep reminding myself to stay focused on the task at hand. For a long time I had wondered if these things that grew up out of mossy patches in the woods were part of the moss or a different species of plant altogether. It turns out it's part of the moss's reproductive system and these shoots uh, expel spores that help to um, plant moss elsewhere in the forest. I really think it's pretty cool. I thought mushrooms were the only thing in the forest that reproduced with spores. So when I found out that moss reproduces the same way, I was pretty fascinated. Speaking of mushrooms, I was noticing a lot of really cool mushrooms today. Mushrooms are the fruit of the forest, and they are the evidence of the absolutely massive system of fungal growth that's occurring under the forest floor that we don't see. Um, when one of those funguses growing underground does fruit, we see the mushroom as the evidence, one little mushroom, but underneath is a amazingly huge network of fungal growth that is actually connecting all the trees um, and helping them with their communication and defense mechanisms and survival in the forest. So trees are pretty big and they look like they kind of stand alone, but they actually are extremely reliant on the fungus that grows under the ground in the forest. Most of what I'm dealing with along these trails is already fallen. It's dead fall timber. So what is rotten, I'll just return to the forest to be decomposed and used, but what still has value as burnable timber, I'll take with me. Rotten logs are pretty cool to look at. Not only do cool things live under rotten logs, but uh, the fungus that you can see on the logs is pretty interesting right there. That really fine white weaving on there is fungal growth. And that's actually decomposing this log and helping it be of value to the forest. Now there's cicada burrows coming into the bottom of this log. <laughs> The poor cicada who dug out of the ground after 17 years only to hit his head on a log and had to make another path, I guess, somewhere else. But that's what those are. We're finding them all over the place right now. You may remember that I have been struggling with figuring out which way to cut these pieces of wood so that my bar and chain do not get pinched. Well, as you'll see here, I'm really starting to get the technique down and I'm doing much better. I think I pretty well have this trail cleared up. There really wasn't much to do here and so that's why I chose to start with this one. <laughs> right? Let's keep it simple. But what I'm about to get into is going to be a whole lot more work. Now, this is the intersection where four trails come together, three that bring you back to the intersection, and the fourth takes you from the intersection out to the fern house. There's a fair amount of cleanup that needs done, um, a lot of stuff from overhead that's just hanging down way too low, so that's what I'm about to get into. Ooh, speaking of fruits of the forest, this one was really cool. It absolutely grabbed my attention while I was looking around figuring out where I was going to start.
Now that tree that's kind of arching up over me and out across the trail, it is damaged at the base. It's scraping on any of our vehicles as we come up through. It needs to go. It's not growing properly. It's going to cause problems. So it is cherry. It'll be perfect to split up for our camp stove. And I just need to figure out how to get down to it to bring it down. The problem is that it is tangled up with tons of grapevine at the top. So um, even after I cut it at the base, I'm not quite sure how I'm going to get the top of it untangled. Yeah, I'm looking at this mess, kind of like a big old tangled ball of yarn, trying to think if I can anticipate at all what it's going to do. <laughs> I'm just anticipating a mess, really. Oh, there we go. I have fell yet another tree. I really think that that is a hysterical term, felling trees, but not nearly as funny as fell a buncher, which is a machine that does this. That makes me laugh every time I hear somebody say it. Fell a buncher. Well, I'm not working with a fell a buncher. I am working with my own two hands here, and this tree is not going far. It's not going to fell the whole way to the ground at all because of the grapevine that's holding it up. The grapevine is actually native to Pennsylvania, believe it or not. It feels invasive in so many ways, but um, this vine is, is a native species. A lot of animals rely on it and love it. It loves sunny places. So even though it grows in the forest, it aims to get up to the top of the forest canopy where it can get the most sunlight. Vines can grow to be up to 90 feet in length, so they just get tangled and they run every which direction. One of the things that I love about spending time in nature and making observations about the natural world is the way it offers me a lot of insights and reminders about the way we live life, the way I live life. The grapevine is kind of one of those things, you know, I couldn't help but think about the way it relied on these trees to help it get where it was going. But once it got to the top, it smothered them out kind of perhaps maybe forgetting that it's the tree underneath it that's supporting it up in the canopy of the forest. So I think about as humans, you know, the people that support us on our journeys, helping us reach our goals and make our dreams realities. And, you know, we need to, to remember that even when we're in the glory of success, oftentimes those people are still supporting us and helping keep us there so it's good to be mindful of that. I just started clipping and pulling and pulling and clipping and just trying to figure out what this tree was still connected to, what was hanging it up, with the goal that I would eventually get it the entire way on the ground where I could section it up for firewood. So I was in the middle of this tug of war when my husband showed up to see how things were progressing and yeah he was pretty entertained and really couldn't stop laughing at the hot mess that I had managed to dump into the middle of this intersection. But I was determined at this point. I was not going to fight with this grapevine for nothing. I decided that I was going to put the grapevine in one pile and all the other brush in another. I decided I'm going to try and make grapevine wreaths, you know, like 
rainy day project or something. <laughs> but it just seemed like a fun thing to be able to add to the cabin, um, kind of adding to the story of how the cabin came to be. And, you know, these grapevines seem pretty determined to stay put on this ridge. At least I feel like they're pretty determined to stay put on this ridge. So I feel like I can honor that and give them a proper place to be admired on the front door or, I don't know, bathroom wall. <laughs> wherever a grapevine hopes to end up. I'm looking back at this week and I feel like I got a lot accomplished. I haven't spent too much time on the project, actually. I've only been able to do so much each day and that's fine. I'm not going to push the pace. I think it's important to honor my time constraints and what my body is capable of. But still, plenty has been accomplished. The site's been cleared, my pottery's been started, and the intersection turned out looking beautiful. Next week, we'll bring with it a fresh set of adventures for the Fern House. There's plenty more that I know I need to address and take care of outside of just splitting wood, even though there's plenty more wood to be split. <laughs> but go ahead, hit subscribe, keep on the journey with me. I am absolutely looking forward to the outcome.